Can we open our Bibles tonight to uh, Revelation? Genesis, the other side of your Bible, verses, uh, chapter 21, verse 9. And we're going to start there, and we're going to try to get to about verse 14 of chapter 22. So not too many verses tonight. Um, as we continue our study through this book of beginnings, by the time we finish tonight, verse 14 of chapter 22, we will have spent about 50 years with Abraham and his wife, Sarah. Uh, we will spend another few years with Abraham through chapter 25. Next week, we will lose Sarah in chapter 23. She goes home to be with the Lord. But just a quick recap so that we know where we're at tonight. It was in Genesis 12 when Abraham was just 75 years old that the Lord had spoken to him to come out of that land that he lived in of idolatry and follow the Lord to a place that he would show him. We, we talked about how he balked for a while. He didn't leave until his father had passed away, but he did come to follow the Lord to a place that God did show him, and then God began to promise to him a descendancy. In the next 24 years that followed, he began to learn how to walk with God in a faithful way, but he wasn't always, and, and didn't always do the right thing. He didn't grow as quickly as probably he wanted to, um, but we will see him shine tonight. He'll, he'll reach the apex, I think, of his faith even tonight. When we came to chapter 17, Abraham was 99 years old, and he was ready to walk with the Lord. In fact, the Lord introduced himself to him by a new name. He called himself El Shaddai, Almighty God. It was the first time that you find that, that word being used, that name being used in the Bible. And, and for Abraham, that was good enough for him. He was going to walk with this God who had made him a promise, and God changed his name, changed the name of his wife, established the right of circumcision to, to always be a reflection that life should be lived not by your flesh, but cutting that away, lived in the Spirit. And so in chapter 17, God gave him a very specific reiteration of the promise. He would have a son. It would be born to his wife, Sarah, in her old age. And you had to name him Laughter, Isaac, Hilarious. Next year, this time, you can count on it, God said so. That very day, Abraham circumcised Ishmael and all of his servants, he was ready to follow the Lord's way. We talked when we went through that chapter that any kind of right, you know, that has, has a religious or a, a, a symbolic significance is only as, as useful as, as your commitment to what it represents. And so it didn't change Ishmael. He didn't walk with God, and he wouldn't. It, it didn't change Abraham. He was already walking with the Lord. And so it was a, a practice that kind of validated the condition, if you will, of the heart. In chapter 18, we, we found Abraham being visited by two, uh, by two angels and by the Lord. The Lord told him about Sodom's destruction to come. Abraham interceded for his nephew Lot with, with the Lord. In chapter 19, Sodom was destroyed. And, and Lot and his families balked even leaving that city. They were just really grounded and rooted so much in that place. And, and there were consequences that would follow for him and his family. In chapter 20, in the year of the promise of a child, um, Abraham tends to stumble a little bit again for some odd reason, and we're not told why he heads south into the area where the Philistines' stronghold of Gerar was. There was a ruler there named Abimelech, although that could just be his title and not his name. But it was an enemy, certainly. And uh, again, Abraham and, and Sarah had had this sin that had so easily beset them for years. They would always lie about who she was. And, and though she was 100, um, apparently that was okay, you know, to, to just, she, he still wanted to protect her and, and not have her taken into somebody's harem or something. And so we, we read that whole story and all. But we had concluded then a couple of weeks ago with, with the first eight verses of chapter 21, with finally the arrival of God's promise, the arrival of of uh, Isaac after years of promise. It must have been a red-letter day. Can you imagine a 100-year-old guy dancing around with a 90-year-old wife, you know? Could have pulled a muscle, threw his hip out, I don't know. <laughs> but they called the boy Isaac, little crack-up, I guess, you know? His, it was his boys and Sarah's boy. It was God's boy that God had given to them. But for, for Abraham, as we get to where we are tonight, it had been tw uh, 25 years since God had first promised a son, lots of lessons of faith in the meantime. He was older now, hopefully wiser now. The birth of his son was amazing. Nothing had thwarted God's promises, even when 
Abraham was weak. You know, they might have been old, but God was still able. When man runs out of options, God still has a clear path. And so tonight we're going to start in verse 9. And like I said, we're going to try to go to chapter 22, verse 14 and stop there. But according to the first eight verses that we read last time, the house of Abraham and Sarah must have been filled with joy. You know, they got this little baby, They're the early years of Isaac's life. Um, but then the weaning took place. And we finished really in verse 8 with the child grew and, and he was weaned. And so three years or so in, in practice of, of, of now he being able to not be fed with his mother's milk, but now being able to eat or, or be weaned and start to eat solid food. And then trouble breaks out again. And so we'll start at verse 9 of uh, chapter 21, verse 9, where we read in uh, verse 8, the child grew and was weaned. Verse 9, and Sarah, Sarah saw the, the, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, and he was scoffing. And therefore she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, namely with Isaac. And the matter was very displeasing in Abraham's sight because of his son. So here's the trouble, right? This, this child that was born to them, um, Ishmael was now 15 or 16 years old. And this sibling rivalry, uh, you know, as you can imagine, Sarah, this wasn't her son, but this was her son. And so there was that, that fuss over Isaac, and, and maybe Ishmael hated it. He was scoffing at this, you know, all the attention maybe he was getting from the parents. I'm sure for years he was dad's favorite because he was the only one, even though it had been the, the result of his fleshly moving, if you will. But he and Sarah never got along, right? You, you remember that she had tried to throw mom and, out, out early on, and, and God had brought her back. But, but this was more than petty jealousy between brothers. This is the flesh, because here's our Bible story, you know, being portrayed as hating when our spiritual life prevails. So you have the product of a flesh, and then now you have the product of great faith. And there's this struggle in the home, and it's difficult. Ishmael had been raised in a godly house. He had been raised with godly influence, and he had experienced much of God's work, everything that you've been reading with us on Wednesday nights from a life of godly parents, you know, they, God had answered their prayers, God had visited them with angels, they had watched the, the fall of Sodom, Ishmael had been around when he watched a 90-year-old woman become pregnant, but none of it mattered to this boy. You know, his heart was just set on a life apart from God. And, and like, unfortunately, many teenagers today, Ishmael, at least at, at that age, saw independence as more valuable than the faith of his fathers. And, and, and it won't be long before he'll take these finer steps, final steps, I should say, away from the Lord with his life. If I could warn you that are young, because now I'm older, um, wise up. <laughs> be teachable. Because the things that you believe when you're 16, you're probably not going to believe at 26. So if you can listen to some counsel from people that you admire and look up to, you can save yourself a lot of grief. But certainly Ishmael did not. On the surface, verse 10 might have seemed wrong. In fact, it just sounds like a mom who's now gotten what she wanted and wants to get rid of that decision that she and her husband had made years earlier. Um, had it not been for Sarah who had come up with this idea, maybe this wasn't a problem at all. And like I said, God had sent her back, right? When, when all of this had, had kind of come to fruition. It said, verse 11, it was very difficult for Abraham, though, because he loved his son. But God then spoke to Abraham and said, don't let it be displeasing in your sight. Because of the lad or because of this bondwoman, whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. And so he loved his son. It was his son indeed. He didn't want this to be a problem in the family. God had just blessed them with another boy. He didn't want this to stress out his wife. But, you know, here the Lord stands up and he agrees with Sarah. It is time to send this boy and his mother down the road. And, and as much as Abraham had that, that fatherly love, he was now told that he should listen to his, the voice of his wife. 
Up to now, if you've been paying attention, we have twice previously seen a husband listening to his wife, and it has led to disaster. Right? Abraham, I'm sorry, Adam listened to Eve. That didn't work out well. Abraham listened to his wife in this Hagar issue. That has that was a disaster, but not so here. And, and to be fair, I'll, I'll point out there are more places in the Bible where the wife is used by the Lord to have the clearest vision of the future. In other words, I would make the argument women listen to the Lord better than the men most of the time. And I say that sorrowfully, but that's just the way it is in the Bible. You know, yet we're told the wives should submit themselves to the husband as unto the Lord. And I think most guys have that underlined and circled in their Bible and have it in several translations. It's the only Greek words that they know and that kind of stuff. But even that's out of context. Because if you read in chapter 5 of Ephesians, I think the three or four verses before that, it says this all starts with a mutual submission based upon a fear of the Lord being filled with the Spirit. So the submission that God is looking for, everyone has a role. But if it isn't controlled by the relationship that we have with God, none of that matters, and it certainly doesn't help us. But if you read that chapter, you will find that submission is good when we're all submitted first to the Lord, wives to their husbands, husbands to love their wives, children to obey their parents, fathers not to exasperate their kids, slaves to their masters, employers, and employees submitting to one another. It all makes sense. So there's clearly defined roles, if you will, and husbands are certainly to be the spiritual leaders of their homes and responsible for their well-being. But God uses wives, guys, a lot. I would be, well, let, let me put it this way. Every unpopular decision I've ever made in the church here as a senior pastor was my wife's idea. I had to be told, what can you do? <laughs> Hardly so. Sarah here wants separation. She wants separation from her son. Come right home from vacation and be in trouble. That's going to be great. <laughs> so the work and the spirit of Ishmael, which is the work of the flesh, needs to be cut away from the life that you have in the spirit. You, you can't print those together. You can't be in church on Wednesday and in the world from Thursday to, to Tuesday. You can't grow that way, right? There has to be a clearly defined line where we just say, I'm going to do things God's way. And, and, and here, by example, the Lord said, it's time for that boy to move along. This mom's been taken care of. This boy can stand on his own two feet. Last time with Sarah, it had been jealousy and hatred. But here, all the focus is on inheritance, right? She shall not inherit or he shall not inherit. It's, it's a spiritual promise, and Sarah wants to have it for her family, and God promises it through this young boy, Isaac. Um, later on in, in Galatians, I think it's chapter 4, toward, and then towards the end of chapter 4, into chapter four, 5, Paul uses this incident, right this one that we're reading, and references it to say, you know, we have to live by our spiritual nature as Isaac did and do the works of faith and be careful of letting the flesh enter in and kind of take us off course. But, but Paul will use this as, as a, a teaching tool. So there has to be, if we're going to grow, you and I, this next year, there's going to have to be a, a separation between flesh and spirit, right? And they're at war with each other and they're certainly not going to help one another where they have to be divided. So... Uh, the Lord tell, says to Abraham, you got to listen to your wife. And it, it made him sorry. It, it was hard. Sin had brought some difficulty, human nature as well. And, and so the Lord says in verse 13, yet I will make of him a nation of the son of, I will make a nation of the son of the one woman because he is your seed. And, and so listen, Abraham, I have, Isaac's my choice and, and my work. And, and, and he is your son. I know you love Ishmael. I will take care of him. I will take care of his mother. I will bless them because he is your seed. And so verse 14, so Abraham rose up early in the morning. He took bread and a skin of water. He put it on her shoulders. He gave it to her and to the boy and he, he sent her away. And she departed and began to wander in the wilderness of Beersheba or Beersheba. 
So Abraham obeyed the voice of the Lord. He, he did what God said, even though it was difficult, and he got up the next morning to do it. A lot of people who read this story, will, the question immediately becomes, well, Abraham's as rich as you could be. Why didn't he just load him up with a caravan of stuff? And man, he'd have it made for life. You know, give him his inheritance early. And in, indeed, you know, that could happen. A lot of commentators, and some taters are more common than others, I guess, uh, refer to the ancient code of Hammurabi, which you can read about. It was, you know, there was a, a certain law of, of the land running at this time in most cultures that, that set the rules. And one of the rules was if you let a slave go and you emancipated him from your care, this is what you gave him. And it certainly matches that law, but I, I think there's something even more important here that we don't want to miss. And it, it's reinforced in the next chapter. And that is Abraham now is in a place at, at 100 years old where he believes that God will do what he says. He's no longer overwhelmed by how am I going to have a child at this age? He's never overwhelmed with, I should lie about my wife, how can he protect her? He's now willing to let God be Almighty God. And so I, I think that as you read verse 14 and as you read the next chapter as well, Abraham was willing to let this, this child that he loved go and the mom go because he was willing to believe that God meant it when he said, I'm going to take care of this boy because he belongs to you. And, and this wasn't a, an issue for him anymore. So he doesn't need to set a caravan or, or bring protection or watch over him. He just needed to let the Lord take care of him. Hard for him, no doubt, as a parent, but God was going to do great things in his life, and, and God had made a promise, and uh, we will see that come to pass here in a couple of chapters. He is more than able. That's what Abraham said. He gave me a child, and I was a hundred. <laughs> God is more than able, which I think is a pretty good word to you parents, especially if you spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about your kids. God gave you your children. The Lord dedicated them to you, and you hopefully have dedicated them back to him. You raise them in the ways of the Lord. You trust that the Lord will open their eyes to see. You train up a child in the ways that he should go, and when he gets old, you, you pray he won't depart from that. So you should do this. You should rest in the Lord. Let God have your kids. You know, let the Lord take care of them. I think sometimes worry reveals a real lack of faith, dressed up as parental concern, because we don't really trust the Lord. Oh, I can't trust him with my kids. My eternity, sure, but not the kids. Not my needs. And you see it sometimes in, we'll see parents can come to church and go, how come your kids are in church with you? Why don't you put them in Sunday school? Oh, no. They may get a cold. Kids have germs, you know. They'll bite each other. There's bullies. I want to protect my son and daughter. Really? Not a smart tactic. Don't try to protect what God is seeking to direct. Let them, let them grow up. Be kids. Pray for your children. Raise them in normal houses. Let them be kids. Their kids are going to get sick, and they're going to get better, too. It's just the way life is. And then at some point, you just got to go, here you go, Lord. Done all I can do. Now I trust them to you. Well, Abraham, in great faith, he sends out his son that he loved. Though God hadn't chosen him, though he was the result of disobedience, it's still his son. And he sends him out with difficulty, but God had spoken, and so that was enough for him. Well, then we read in verse 15 that the water and the skin that Abraham had given to Ishmael was, was used up and to Hagar. And so she placed the boy, 16, under one of the shrubs, and then she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, and she said to herself, let me not see the death of my son. And so she sat opposite, opposite him, and she lifted up her voice, and she wept. And God heard the voice of the lad and sent the angel of the Lord, or an angel of God, down to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad, and where he is, arise, lift up the lad, and hold him with your hand. I will make of him a great nation. So... God did what God promised. Ishmael prays. God hears his prayer. God sends good news. And, and <laughs> pick him up. There's no sense crying here. Move along. You're going to be fine. You're gonna, he's going to live, not die. I've got plans for him. 
and they're good ones. And so she picks them up, and God does what God has said, which is a beautiful picture. Here's a, here's a single mom <laughs> struggling to survive. My heart goes out to single moms. There's so many of them today. Two people, one income, very difficult. But the Lord has a way of providing, doesn't he? Best solution, man. Turn your life to Jesus. Let him be the Lord of your life. There's a great verse in Psalm uh, 60. I think it's verse 60. It's chapter 68, verse 6, I think, where it says, The Lord sets solitary people into families. And certainly that's what the church should be. He, he, he brings us together together. And caring for one another, be open to that. You know, we're in the family. So God makes a promise. We read in verse 19 that the Lord then opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She didn't see it before for some reason. Maybe the Lord just put one there. And she went and she filled that skin with water and gave the lad a drink. And so God was with the boy and he grew and, and dwelt in the uh, wilderness. He became an archer, dwelling in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother took a a wife for him from the land, unfortunately, of Egypt, which again, you know, that, that life in the flesh. So mom finds him a bride, bride, not from Abraham's family, but from Egypt. Now Ishmael will have 12 sons. We will find their names in chapter 25 when we get to the end of Abraham's life. If you want to find them early, just look at the, the League of Arab Nations today. I think you'll find all of them there. But, but needless to say, God was faithful to um, the promise to Abraham. Well, then we change directions a little bit, and we get to verse 22, and we read, And so it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the, the commander of his army, came to speak to Abraham. They said, God, God is with you in all that you do. Now, therefore, swear to me that my, by God that you will not deal falsely with me or with my offspring, with my posterity, but that according to the kindness that I've done to you, you will do to me and to the land in which you have dwelt. And Abraham said, I swear. Now, if you were with us back in chapter 20, you might remember that this is the place Abraham showed up. And again, he went to that typical lying about he and his wife. And Abimelech took a liking to Sarah and had taken her and was <laughs> had fancy ideas of marrying her, even though she's quite old. Um, but, but that had, you know, he had found it out. He, he had gotten angry. The Lord actually had, had shut up the womb of everyone living in this Philistine area so that no one got pregnant because God had promised to get this older woman pregnant as a promise. And God didn't want anybody to be confused as to who was the father here or who was the, 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 the God, if you will, behind this miracle. And so when, when Abimelech found out about it, she, he yelled at <laughs> at Abraham, but, but he said, you can just stay here wherever you want. You don't have to leave, you know, but just <laughs> come on. You know, you're lying to me. You put me in a difficult spot. I didn't do it out of unkind heart. I, I was clear in this, and God had forgiven and, and certainly said to Ab Abimelech, I, I just warned you, you haven't done anything wrong. So uh, he hadn't driven him away. He had, God told Abraham to pray for the wombs of those who lived in the area, and they were opened up. But this is now several you know, years later, and, and now comes this Abimelech guy, and, and he was gracious to Abraham, and, and he, he now asks him to be kind to his descendants, but he says, and he, st he starts with the words, I know that God is with you, which is interesting because he started with, you're a creep, and you're a liar, and you may tell me you belong to the Lord, but everything I see is just deceitful, and the God that I spoke to knew that I was being pure of heart. Which is an interesting picture because you, you get this lesson that when you've let other people down in your witness, maybe even sinned against them, sometimes you feel like, gosh, I'll never be able to reach them because I messed up <laughs> what, I, what I shouldn't have messed up. But you can outlive your critics. And Abraham seems to have outlived his critics. And, and as he returns to this place where God can use him, it, it seems to me that that. Abimelech has been brought over to the light, so to speak, by the fact that Abraham is now living in such a life that he was, say, the, this foreign king said, I know that God's with you. So I need your blessing upon my family. I know that you're, you're standing with the God that I've had to answer to. And, and regardless of what he might have thought about Abraham and his God early on, Abraham, I'm wrong about you. God is with you. I just want your assurance that you'll be kind to my family in the days that it will pass, even as I was kind to you when I found out what you had done to me. 
So here's a good lesson. Even at, at a hundred years old, consistent godly living over time will heal strained relationships, right? This was a pretty bad falling out, if you will, between a heathen king and, and God's man in, in the land. But, but eventually the walls were removed and it seems the bridges were built. And so Abraham makes the promise. I, I will indeed, as God's man, do exactly what you have done for me. So we read in verse 25, so Abraham then brought up well to Abimelech, rebuked him because there was a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. And Abimelech said, I didn't even know that this was done. Why didn't you tell me? Uh, I, this is the first time I've heard of it today. And so Abraham took some sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and the two of them made a covenant. So Abraham had recently lost, it seems, a well that he had dug, by the way, prized possession in the desert. And he, um, he had allowed Abimelech's guys to take it. He hadn't done anything about it, but he brings it up now that they're talking without reprisal. And so Abraham, um, you know, this is the Abraham who chased kings across the country to save Lot. He's a milder guy now at 100. But needless to say, Abimelech again said, I wasn't aware of it. So they make this peace treaty and certainly, you know, seven ewes or, or female lambs was kind of the oath. Uh, we've gone to Beersheba in, in, uh, on our travels to Israel. It's a hard place to get to because it's well to the south. Uh, our bus driver, though, was born there. And so he took us one, one, one year at home. And we met another bus driver whose wife was a, an ambassador for the United Nations. So she had like 60 of us in, in, in their uh, front yard, and she fed us all, and she practiced her English. It was kind of interesting. But Beersheba, the word Beersheba means seven, but it also means oath. And so it's kind of the place where the seven lambs were slaughtered, and, and there was an agreement and an oath made. And like I said, in our trip, I think in April, we're going to be going there again because I think we have this contact with this woman now. So it's a great place. It's a very ancient place, but it is there that, that God re healed really the, the witness of Abraham re because everything's about Abraham's 100 now and, and Abraham's going to walk with Almighty God. So we, we read in verse 40, uh, 33, sorry, Abraham then planted a, a tamarisk tree there in Beersheba. Uh, tamarisk is a is a um, evergreen tree. And so they called the name, and, he, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And this is the first time we find that name for the Lord. In, in, in Hebrews, it, it's El Elyon. And El Elyon means just that, everlasting. And so Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days, but now he was a witness in, a, in kind of a foreign part of the land rather than a guy who was stumbling his way along. Which brings us to these last 14 verses. I, I will tell you that everything that we can determine from the Bible, it appears that 21 to 23 years pass between this last verse and the first verse of chapter 22. So that Abraham is 125 years old, and Isaac is now 25. So the story we're going to read happened years later, and it is that progressive stepping by faith that you find in Abraham's life, where, where hopefully you find it in yours too. The things you're struggling with today aren't what you struggled with when you first got saved. Oh, there's always struggles, but they're not the same struggles, right? I, I used to have a pretty, pretty foul mouth. It was a gift, I thought. <laughs> I could cuss as an adverb, as an adjective, as an... <laughs> and that got cleaned up pretty quickly, but... but even though it doesn't come out of your mouth, it still, sometimes still runs through your head, you know? God wants to clean you from the inside out. So this is 125 years. This is now, this is now 50 years of Abraham's life that we have, are reading about and, and, and considering. And with all of those years of growing in faith step by step, these first 14 verses present to us a man of God, Abraham, who now has to climb to the summit of faith. I mean, this is his hard and as difficult as it will go. It was in, I think, um, May 29th of 1953 that Sir, uh, 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 Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, at 11.30 in the morning, was able to hoist a British flag atop Mount Everest. First guy that ever made it. It took lots of planning, years of planning. 
got up to uh, 29,002 feet, climbed higher than any man has ever climbed, and no one will ever climb higher because it's the highest place that you can go. But he, you know, he trained in Nepal. He set up base camps and, and fundraisers. He failed plenty before he made it. This is really Abraham's climb to the top, you know? This, this is the kind of stuff that God might, would only put you through and put you in at a time when you've learned 50 years of who the God is that you serve. This is 50 years of facing a mountain now. And this Mount Moriah, as, and the shoulder of which will one day be called Mount Calvary, or Golgotha, would be the hardest climb of his life. And he would be 125. He would live 50 more years. But it would be at the apex, or, the, or the, I guess the pinnacle of climbing by faith. So we read in verse 1, Now it came to pass that these things... Uh, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, 25 years old now, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains upon which I will show you. You know, when 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 we do weddings, we we, we spend six months with counseling with young couples. In fact, the church, you know, our board of directors has established over the years that if you won't go to counseling, we won't do your wedding. We're not a service. <laughs> we, you know, you, you want to get somebody to do a service. There's a lot of people that you can get them to do a service. We, we'd rather try to help you stay married and consider what you're doing. But, but you know, on the wedding day, there's often that, that, you know, that promise to love no matter what life brings whether it's better or worse or richer or poor or sickness and in health, death do us part. And rarely do young 18, 20, 25-year-old kids consider what that could entail. When, when Abraham got up this morning, this particular morning, uh, on, on the day that his crowning achievement of his faith and 50 years of relationship with God would be tested, he would be taken through this experience so that you and I could learn what was in the heart of a father in one day having to send his son to die for the sins of the world. In marriage, when things don't turn out ideally, and they never do, you either have to tear up the picture in your head of what you thought it should be like and embrace the perfect or imperfect person that you've married, or you have to tear up the person that you married in favor of that picture in your head. You only have two choices, right? It, it is the same when you come to the Lord. We commit our lives to him and have in our mind certain expectations of what God should do for us and what he shouldn't do, how we should answer, how we should respond. He doesn't always do what we want. And so, you know, when things don't go our way, we either have to lay down our will for his or lay him down for our wills. It's really the only two choices that we have. And when we lay him down for our will, what we're left with is, you know, the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of things that will choke, out, choke the word out of my life. So I have a choice to make, just like young married couples that are committing themselves to the Lord. So when you get to the words and after these things, and, and like I said, we jump 25 years down the road, a, a reaching back shows us 50 years of sojourning from leaving home at 75 years old God's appearances to him, covenants that God made with him, promises that God fulfilled, the birth of his son, the promise of a descendancy to a son that still isn't married and still has absolutely no children. And yet God made a promise. And God comes now, and we read it here, to test him. You think at 125, just leave me alone. Wait till I go to heaven and give me a high five. It's been 50 years for crying out loud. I need to be tested. Apparently so. It makes no logical sense. Hey, but you, to, till death do us part. For rich or poor, sickness or to health, whatever you want, Lord. That's what I'm going to do. And, and he comes to test him, to, to put him to the test. Not to tempt him, as the old King James unfortunately translates the word. In fact, isn't it James who said in chapter 1 verse 13, let no one say when he is tempted, I've been tempted by God. God doesn't tempt anyone. 
But God does test. And though those words are very similar, they have very different kind of application. Satan comes to test you, tempt you to destroy you. He doesn't come for your benefit. He doesn't come for the honor of the Lord. He comes to test you, tempt you so you can take you away. God comes to test you to develop your faith. The, the problem for us is sometimes you can't tell the difference. They're just one and the same, but the purposes are, are different. So <laughs> you have to handle it the same way. Joseph said to his brothers, you meant this for evil, God meant this for good. One was out to tempt and to destroy. God would use the same experience to help Joseph be stronger and, and more faithful to the Lord. Job had the same issue. Have you considered my servant Job perfect in all of his ways, so committed to the Lord? And yet here's Satan saying, hey, I can get him to fall. I can get him to trip up. I can take him down the wrong road. Well, you go ahead and try, the Lord said. You keep your hands off of him. You don't do any more than I allow you to do. One came to tempt. The other came to test for our benefit. God allows it for good. If you go to the Romans 8.28 principle, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. If we go to that principle, then we would understand that God will always allow trials to be in your life for the sake of letting your faith grow. Not to hurt you, not to turn you around, not to turn you away, but to make you stronger. That's his purpose. However, Satan would like to, to use those same things and say, well, give up on God. Look at what he's putting you through. But if I know the heart of God, I can say, well, he, he must think there's a good reason for this. Well, I don't know. But Job came to know that was so, and so did D uh, Joseph. And Abraham is about to come face to face with it here after 50 years of walking with the Lord by faith. When NASA, which now I guess back in order, is, is temp testing materials for space use, it is always testing them from the ability or, or from the standpoint, does this have the ability to preserve life? Will this last in that kind of an environment? They're not looking to prove it to be wrong. They're proving to see if it'll withstand the cold or withstand the, the, the stress or withstand the pressure? Will this keep life going? Can we use this? It isn't designed to tempt. It is designed to stress or to, to test, if you will. So the purpose of, of your testing and mine are always with God's attitude of being good. It comes from the heart of God for your benefit. He wants you to be patient. He wants to teach you about his love and endurance and standing fast, and how the world won't satisfy, but it takes going through these tests, and you'd say, I'd love to say, you know, well, if you've been around 50 years, he should just leave you alone. It's just not the way the Lord operates. He desires truth in the inward parts, David said in Psalm 51. It takes time to crush that all in there. This is the only type in the Bible, in the entire Old Testament, that speak distinctly of human sacrifice for human sin. It is, it is allegorical in the sense that it represents God's solution for man's sin. There is no other place that it is found, and there is no other chapter in the Bible that so clearly communicates an insight into the heart of the Father and what he will have to do down the road in sending Jesus to die for the sins of the world. In Psalm 22, in Psalm 69, in Isaiah 53, you can read about what was going through the heart of Jesus as he came to give his life for the sins of the world. Father, why have you forsaken me? The, the struggle that he faced. But this is the only place you get to look at the sacrifice from the, from the eyes of the Father in heaven. And he, ha and he takes us through it by testing Abraham. This is what it meant to the heart of the Father. If you spend enough time here, it, it'll break your heart. Because the sacrifice is, 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 you can't begin to measure what God went through to save you in sending his son. It was examination day. <laughs> the finals, if you will, for Abraham. Testing to prove the genuineness of his faith. And, and if you read the Bible correctly, this is the first time Abraham had heard the word of the Lord in over two decades. The last time was the birth of his son. 
And then one day, after these things, as a test from God, Abraham, yes, Lord, I got something for you to do, anything. I want you to kill your son. I want you to offer him to the Lord. Can you imagine? On the stage of Abraham's life, there will be this type and this shadow and this great drama of, of what Calvary will be like. And if you reach out and feel Abraham's beating heart, I think you can feel the pulse of the heart of the Father because it is indeed for that purpose. The word Moriah, Mount Moriah, the word Moriah means foreseen by Jehovah, or God has seen it beforehand. That's literally what that word means. God knew when he created man that it was going to have to come to this. It was going to have to come to this. If, if he wanted you and sin would get in the way, it would have to come to this. And he was more than willing to save. I think it's Revelation 13, says, All will worship upon the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life because of the lamb that was slayed before the foundation of the world. In other words, God knew it was coming to this. Notice what we read here. Abraham, I'm here. Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. This is the first time the word love is found in the Bible. I think we've told you before, the principle of, of biblical interpretation is called hermeneutics, is that the first mention of a word should define its primary use. Well, here's the word love for the first time. It is not the word love of a husband for a wife. It is not the love of God for man. It is, it is the love of a father for his son. In the New Testament, the word love is found first with these words, this is my beloved son. It is applied in the same manner. Only son. What about Ishmael? God sent him away. God never recognizes the works of our flesh. I think there'll be a lot of surprises in heaven when, when we show up for credit and find we're not getting any. Because they were works of the flesh. Works that are done for the Lord will be tested, Paul said, of what sort they are. And, and the word literally means what motivated them. What, what, what brought us to that point? And, and the rewards will be those who survive the fire and come forth as gold rather than wood or stubble. It'll be a revealing day. It, it isn't salvation that's rewarded. It, it's the, the reward of faithfulness. So Abraham is called to do what God the Father will do. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And to learn by himself and to show us what the heart of God was like towards you in making the decision to save you and pay the price. Abraham had learned much about God's heart already. When he was called out of Ur of the Chaldees, he learned the heart of God towards the world system. Come away from them. Separate yourself. In waiting for the land, he learned about God's patience. In fact, the Lord said to him, this land will be yours, but you're going to have to wait 400 years because the sins of the Amorites that live in it now are not yet full. And he began to learn about how patient God is. He had to wait for a son, 25 years, that God's timing was always right. And now the heaviest duty of all, he gets, he gets to enter into the fellowship of God's suffering. If you ever would like to read a book that I think did a, did, does justice to this chapter, it is a book called The View from uh, Mount Calvary by a fellow named John uh, Phillips. And, and I'm pretty sure it's the best book I've ever read just on this topic alone, um, and, and it's just so moving. Another thing I want to point out to you as we get down to verse 3, there is in Hebrew a grammatical practice, and it is called a polysynodon. Big word, doesn't matter. But it literally means that when you begin to use the word and over and over in a sentence without a break, it, 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 is, it is Hebrew's ways of saying that these actions occur without interruption. And he did this, and he did that, and he did this, rather than in a couple days later, and next week, he picked up the, the pace. In this case, it, it, de it declares the immediate and complete obedience of a 125-year-old man to do the one thing that must have violated his conscience the most. Take your only son that you're going to have kids with and sacrifice him. And, and rather than question the Lord, and rather than argue with God, he immediately acted without hesitation 
And so you find this word and constantly used. In fact, if you like in your own Bibles, from verse 3 to verse 14, just circle the ands. They are all a translation of the original. They are there to, to just say, here's, here's what Abraham, this was Abraham's response because he knew God. He knew Almighty God. He knew El Shaddai, the one who could provide. So we read in verse 3. So Abraham rose up early. Now, wouldn't you on that day have risen up late? Maybe I can make it tomorrow. No, Abraham got up early in the morning and he saddled his donkey and he took two of his young men with him and he took Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. Up early on the donkey with his son, wood split for a fire and an offering heading for the place God had said, the decision had been made, the place had been chosen, and Abraham, now old in faith, is able and willing to do what God has said. Verse 4, Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes, and he saw the place far off. Now put yourself in Abraham's shoes. For three days he saw his son Isaac as dead. This is what God had told him. I don't, know, I don't think he told him, but this is what was carrying around in his heart. Abraham's sight, quite a turmoil within. God had promised that this boy would be through, this boy, this descendants would be so many that you couldn't count them. Abraham, though, was at the height of faith. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter of faith, you will read by faith, Abraham, comma, when he was tested, comma, offered up Isaac. And he who was received by promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac shall your seed be called, concluding that God was able to even raise him up from the dead, from which he did receive him in a figurative sense. So he saw him as dead, but he went, well, I don't know what God's going to do, but God can't violate his promise. And now as an older man, I am sure he will do what he says. He didn't know how, but, but he looked in, upon this as a, a, a venture of faith, and he, was, he didn't balk, and like I said, all of those ands will say to you, he just he didn't stop. But, but here's the heart of Abraham, who didn't believe that even Isaac's sacrifice could negate, if you will, the word of God. So finally, verse 2, they arrived at Moriah from the desert area of Beersheba. We read in verse Five, And Abraham said to his young men, the two who he had taken, You stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder, Texans, and worship, and we will come back to you. We're leaving. We're coming back. Not I'm coming back. We're coming back. With amazing faith and tremendous confidence, he asked these two men to watch the donkey and we'll be back. By the way, we're going to go there to worship. Remember this your hermeneutics word? This is the first time you find the word worship in the Bible. And it is not, it, it, by definition, here in the text, it, it is the bowing down to the will of God in obedience. It isn't singing with a loud voice or raising your hands, because you could have done that tonight in disobedience, in rebellion. We wouldn't know the difference, but God would. But this word worship, by definition, is someone that comes to say, God, I'll do whatever you want. I'll, I'll obey. I'm all in. That's the worship God's looking for from you and I. Okay, Lord, I'm going to do it. I don't get it. I certainly don't like it. But I'm going to do it because you're the Lord. It's, it's kind of like uh, Jesus took the three into the garden with him, you know, before the arrest. But then he separated himself from them to go pray because there was a relationship between him and the father that he couldn't share with these boys, right? It was just that, that heart that he had when he said to the father, you know, father, if it's possible, <laughs> let this time, this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, it's not what I want, but it, it's what you want. He came to worship, but he struggled in his flesh as, as we would as well. So Abraham and Isaac go together, but 
It's a fellowship that only Abraham can have with God, right? It's, 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 it's what you only feel from the heart of a man that you put yourself next to and say, what in the world was he going through? We read in verse 6 that Abraham then took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it on the back of his son. Doesn't that sound like the crucifixion? And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went up together. And Isaac, not being an idiot, <laughs> said to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, yes, my son. Look, I see the wood. I see the fire. Where is the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself or for himself the lamb as a burnt offering. And so the two went up together. So the wood was carried by the son. You can, can you imagine going up the hill as a 125-year-old guy? We went to, into the mountains in Costa Rica this week, um, zip lining. I didn't realize that if you're almost 70, you shouldn't do a lot of this, but I did anyway. But it was the climb. I'm on heart medication because I had that stroke a lot five years ago. So everything's like slow. And then there's, there's all these kids with us drinking beer and laughing. Hey, I, you know, hey and I'm going, Ugh. I can just imagine, you know, old Abraham with every step, you know, not only old, but grieved. How hard could this possibly be to this man? He's got to take every step. He's getting closer to what he inevitably doesn't want to do and doesn't even want to consider. And yet he hasn't balked going forward to obey the Lord. Heavier heart, life, knife and fire in his hand. Hasn't said a word. It's Isaac who goes, what are you, what are you doing here? And, and the way it reads in, in, in Hebrew, it literally is God will provide himself a sacrifice. Or if you will, God will be the sacrifice. The Lord will take care of this. I, I, I think that Isaac at 25 and not being a foolish kid would have seen the tears in his dad's eyes. Maybe the sweat on his brow, the heavy steps that he was taking, the, the fire and the knife and the weight of the wood and the, the question that was inevitable, you know. And, and then the answer that came with a determined look in the eyes of faith that kind of said to Isaac, no more discussions. You know, this is where we're at and this is what we're doing. God will provide himself. It's an amazing prophecy, especially when you think about, you know, we're, we're about 2050 B.C. at this point. He didn't know, now, Abraham didn't know how this was going to work. He didn't know when it might be resolved. He didn't know where God would take this. But one thing he was sure of, God would take care of it. And he hasn't hesitated to move forward. As they beat our Lord and mocked him, they crucified him. It was the father who had to watch his son bear the, the, the weight of the sins of the world. He could have stopped it. You would have stopped it. How could you not stop it? But if he stops it, he loses you. So the father struggles with this with this sacrifice that's absolutely important and necessary. Abraham experienced that sorrow. Verse 9, then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order. And then he bounds Isaac, his son, and laid him upon the altar and upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. How must he have felt going through all this? And, and understand, Isaac at 25 could easily have overthrown his father. <laughs> There's no way this 125-year-old guy is keeping that boy on. You know, what are you? You've, you've gone nuts, Dad. But Jesus came willingly. Not my will, but yours be done. Peter, put away your sword. Shall I not drink the cup which you, my Father has given to me? Don't you think that I could now pray to my Father and he would send me 12 legions of angels? As always, I'll talk to my Father. But the Father wasn't coming through now. This was his plan. He prayed there at the 
in the Kidron Valley at the brook there on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Only when the knife was poised in the air and was about to fall as this young man submitted to the will of his father, willfully, I don't know, struggling, maybe taught that God had made great promises, I don't know. It was the angel of the Lord. Again, that theophany, that pre-existent appearance of Christ, if you will, who stays Abraham's hand. We read in verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. You sure lie, lie, wait till the last minute. <laughs> do not lay your hand upon the lad and do or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Who can measure what it would have cost Abraham to come this far? for better or worse, richer or poor. So God saw his son as a lamb led to the slaughter. Wood laid on his back, spikes driven home, the knife of judgment against sin piercing his heart, the, the work of the cross enacted here so that we could find out what his heart was like. And by the time you get to Romans chapter 8, verse 32, you read these words, and he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him now freely give you all things? What more do you need when you have that type of father who has given that much so that you could have life? James, commentating, I should say, on the actions of Abraham said, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac, his son, on the altar? Do you not see that faith working together with works was made perfect? This was a demonstration of a man that now had graduated by faith. We finish with these words, verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and there behold behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So he quickly went and got this ram and offered it up for a burnt offer, a offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the place, the name of the, of the place, um, the Lord will provide, it is written in Hebrew, Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mountain of the Lord, it shall be seen. God will provide. There is little difference to God between vision and provision. He will supply all of your needs, beginning with your need to be forgiven of your sin. In the mountain of the Lord, in this mountain, Mount Moriah will be the same place that Solomon will come years later, David's son, to build the temple, 2 Chronicles chapter 3. It'll be the very same place that Jesus will hang on the cross. And that same place is tracked from here forward. On the crest of Moriah, there are a series of caves, if you'll go to Israel sometime, that make it look like, and unfortunately with some landslides, it looks less and less like, but, but it certainly had the appearance for many years of a, of a skull, it is called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And it is clearly seen if you go to the Damascus Gate or the Herod's Gate in the old city of Jerusalem, just above the bus station. Um, there is that place, that hill, that shoulder of this mountain uh, where Jesus will give his life. But it is the very place that Abraham came this day to obey the Father. It is a foreshadowing of the love of the Father for all men. I, 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 no, we were not told, but I, I, I see, I see Isaac hugging that lamb like crazy. Oh, but I love my ram. <laughs> and that's, I guess, the way you should be holding on to Jesus. You were on the altar for your sin, and he took your place. Amen?
Father, we thank you tonight for just a beautiful story of your, of your love. We can, uh, through just these few verses, understand certainly better your heart for us as your people, your love as a father for your son, the, the cost that it must have been for you to be willing to go this distance so that man in his sin would still have an opportunity to stand with you and be with you for, forevermore. And, and we, we pray that these verses that we read tonight, we, we go through them in an hour, that you would impress upon our hearts to think them through, and to put ourselves there where Abraham and allow you to just speak to us of how, how great of a love God has and how Jesus was willing sent to die. He was born to die. Christmas is all about our Savior coming to die so that we could live and that we might, like Isaac being released from that, that place of judgment, that we might hang on to you for dear life, knowing without you we, we die. We, we, we suffer because the sin, the wages of sin is death, but it's your gift to us that's eternal life. If tonight you are here and you have not given Jesus your life, I would, I would greatly seek to encourage you to consider what kind of love God would have for you that he would offer his son so that you could go to heaven. Not so you could work your way there. Not so you could present to him a, a list of your accomplishments or a resume of your good deeds. But that you would admit you, you deserve to, to get what God said sin would bring, death. But God so loved you that he allowed Jesus to come and take the knife, the death we deserve, so that you could live. If, if you'll consider that, our pastors will be up front tonight to pray with you to give Jesus your life. Do that. If you're not sure, do that. Because the judgment one day for man standing before God will not be how many times did you lie and, and what did you take that didn't belong to you. There's only going to be one question you're going to be asked, and the question is this, what have you done with my son? Because what the father did and allowed his son to go through was so that you could have life. If you're watching online, you can follow the the direction that you'll find in the description box and follow that link and you'll find a page about born, being born again and receiving the Lord. Would you read that tonight and give Jesus your life? He, he'll hear what you have to say. He'll, he'll see you and, and respond. We go to heaven because of Jesus. We have life because of Jesus. But don't think for a minute the Father sat idly by how he must have constrained himself when they spit in his face and, and hit him with their whips and mocks them with their mouths. God so loved the world.